Well, what a joy to gather together uh, to live today for the glory of God, and I pray that his word will assist us to that end. Uh, today we're looking at the, the huge doctrine of the second coming of Christ, and although we all know that doctrine's out there, and as you'll see in a moment, it's, it's one of the larger doctrines that's uh, presented verse-wise in the Bible, but behind that is a larger issue, and that is that God does what he says. God keeps his word. You know, we have uh, a lot of people that make promises uh, at different times in their life, whether they're political or business or whatever, but then it doesn't work out, and they go, it didn't work out. You know, your job didn't work out, or the funding didn't work out, or our plans didn't work out, but that's not so with the Lord. When God says he's going to do something, he not only promises he'll do it, the Bible says he watches over his word and he performs what he says. And and Jesus said he's coming back. And so this morning we're, we're seeing the implications as we look and you see the title this morning, The Day of the Lord. By the way, the second coming in the Old Testament is called The Day of the Lord. We know it more by the New Testament, second coming, or the return of Christ. But the day of the Lord, and what happens when God shakes the earth? See, this, what we're looking at this morning is the first time God introduces himself planet-wide. The first time God tells all those humans either ignored him or didn't believe and denied that he existed, he kind of gives them a little jolt and says, I'm actually here and wakes the earth up. And that's what we're looking at this morning. But basically, the doctrine of the second coming in God's word is very big. It's taught in God's word by over 1,800 verses. Uh, 318 of them are in the New Testament alone. So it's, it's a huge doctrine. And God's word is immensely prophetic. When the Bible was written, it was made up of at least... The, the 66 books were at least 27% prophetic. And so over 3,500 years since the Bible was first began to be written, many of those prophecies have been fulfilled. But there are an astounding number that are still awaiting God watching over them to perform them. See, they're, they're kind of like waiting for the exact moment and then the prophecies at God's command spring to life. Well, those prophecies, and many of them, are still slumbering, not yet awakened and launched into history by the hand of God. But God is watching over every one of them. Jeremiah 1.12 tells us that, that God is watching over his word to perform it. But our text this morning is just one of those many verses portraying an event that's quietly awaiting a future moment. If you want to open to Revelation 6 and verse 12, I want to show you the, the just lying beneath the surface, ready to spring forth prophecy that is about the second coming. And what we're going to see is, at a future moment, just as God said it would be, verse 12 will happen. And, and watch these words. And this is what is going to be the backdrop. It's going to be the, the, the underlying uh, message all the way through everything I say is what God promised is going to happen in verse 12. And here it is. And I looked when he opened the sixth seal and, and it the I is John, and the he is Jesus. So John, if you remember in Revelation, is in heaven, taking a tour, led by the Lord to record for us, Christ church, the future. And John is watching as Jesus walks up to the throne of the Almighty, is handed this scroll, which is, we've seen over the last few months, the title deed to the universe, and Jesus begins to break one seal at a time. And now we've gotten to the sixth of seven seals on this scroll. And so I looked, and when he opened the sixth seal, and behold, and here comes a succession, actually there are six disasters that just mark the very first entrance of God directly, visibly, uh, and and notably into human affairs. See, God basically has kind of been in the background. That's why most people deny him or ignore him. He's just kind of, if he's even there, he's somewhere, but he's not here. Now God is here, and he reaches in. And, And when he reaches in, it says, and behold, 
There was a great earthquake, number one. And the sun became black as sackcloth of hair. That's the second. And the moon became like blood. Now, what I want you to think about is that there are many of these slumbering prophecies. God says these are all, it's kind of like I remember when I, and, and uh, this past week, thanks for praying for me, it was a real challenge. I was a little disoriented uh, when we were in New York all week because I got there and the first thing that greeted me were two families from Calvary and I said, what are you doing here? I'm in New York. And they said, yeah, we thought we'd check out what you do on the road. And I went, oh. Then I turned and there was someone from the very place, first place Bonnie and I were served in Los Angeles and they were there and I thought, whoa. And then I looked over and there was someone from Rhode Island and Tulsa. And I said, I am disoriented. I don't know where I am. You know, there are people from every part of, of my life. But when I was looking at one of the Rhode Islanders, I thought about one of our people that worked for the underwater warfare division of the U.S. government. And, you know, we're hearing about the NSA, but there's a lot of unbelievable things our government has done over the years. And one of them are these slumbering anti-submarine devices that were developed by some of our scientists and they just sit down on the, the little passes in the ocean floor and there are several places in the world where where all submarines in order to stay down undetectable have to go through these kind of valleys under the ocean that have mountains on both sides and the US government all over the world planted these little devices and they're listening devices and they're hundreds of feet underwater but they listen because every submarine has a signature no matter how careful you make a submarine depending on how tight you tightened everything and how well you machine the the turbine and everything else the signature of the propulsion is unique for every ship there are no two ships that make the same sound the combination of how they're built their size the configuration, as well as their engine, has slowly been analyzed by the American military, and they have actually identified and named every combatant and enemy submarine in the world. And the computers listening in these devices know exactly when everybody's submarine goes through these different, so they always know where they are. And there's this big Norfolk, Virginia, huge wall. This guy used to tell me about it. He was going to invite me to see it, but you can't get clearance to get in there. But it has the whole world, and it shows where every submarine of every enemy power is at any moment. Because slumbering down there are these little listening devices, but they're not just listening devices. They're highly deadly explosive mines that when they hear one coming and they want to destroy it, it slowly begins to rise and get into range. And when that submarine's overhead from beneath, it erupts and destroys the submarine. Now, they haven't done that yet, but they're out there waiting. Did you know in a real sense, just like every submarine is in danger because it doesn't even know that's underneath there, there are prophecies slumbering and they're just beneath the surface of world events. And, and if we focus merely on the world events and don't understand the prophecy that's slumbering there, we don't understand what God is doing. God is waiting. But these slumbering prophecies are amazing, and none of the seals of Revelation 6 have yet been broken and launched on the earth. They still slumber. They're like giant volcanic eruptions waiting to happen. And just as the white-hot magma rises and slowly builds, and you know that's what happens. There are little volcanoes going on all volcanic events all over the world. And that through the vents and fissures, that magma slowly rises to the future. Then it starts swelling, and they call it the lava dome. And then finally, in a huge explosion, it erupts. Well, those prophecies are just waiting to be, trigger, to be triggered by God. See, it's God that's holding the trigger. He's watching over them. And when they do... And when those prophecies begin, the Superman, the one humans have always longed for, will emerge. And so that global peace and prosperity that the world has always wanted, the world has always wanted some kind of a utopia where, where everything is, is fun and, 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 and safe and prosperous, and, and it finally comes, and that's the white horse. And that deception of the first seal will be followed quickly by global warfare, the red horse, and then by starvation and scarcity, we saw, the black horse, and then death and pestilence, the pale horse, and then finally by countless martyrs who die for the name of Christ under the rule of the final emperor, the false Christ, 
the fifth seal. But you know what's amazing is only four of the 66 books of the Bible don't have prophecies about the future. Only four have no prophecy. All the other 62 do. Those four are Ruth and Song of Solomon, Philemon, and 3 John. But basically, if we were to, to kind of do a little, in fact, uh, this week I, I, I saw some people that used to be my students, and so I said, boy, I still feel like I'm back as a professor in seminary. But if I gave you a page out of seminary, it would be this. Out of the Old Testament's 23,210 verses, 6,641 have predicted material. That's over 28%, 28 and a half, actually. And out of the New Testament, 7,914 verses, 1,711 have prophetic material. That's 21 and a half percent. When you combine those two, out of the entire Bible's 31,000 plus verses, 8,300 plus contain predictive material. That's 20 seven percent that means that every fourth verse in the bible is prophetic every fourth verse amazing to think about it's kind of like the earth every fourth person is chinese every fourth verse is prophetic and it's amazing to think of the implications. And of those 1,800, as I mentioned, 318 in the New Testament, deal with the second coming. And if you took all 1,800 of these verses describing the second coming and put them all together instead of scattered across the, the 64 books of the Bible, if you spread them out and then gathered them together, they'd be equivalent to one-fourth of the whole New Testament. Think of your New Testament and think that, that the verses just about the second coming of Christ make up 1,800 verses in the Bible. That is why I said it's a big, big doctrine. We need to know and understand that the second coming is the day of the Lord. So in your minds, make that connection. All of those Old Testament, huge swaths of, of the prophets talking about the day of the Lord are talking about the second coming. And that's big in the Bible. In God's Word, the description of Christ's second coming, covering those 1,800 verses, employ many different biblical terms. And we're examining this day of the Lord, second coming, in two parts. Last time we looked at the Lord part, who he is that's coming. Today we're looking at the day that he comes and what he does as he begins to arrive into humanity. And basically, last time we saw in Hebrews 1 that the ruler of everything is coming. Now, right now, Jesus is seated at the right hand of God. His, it's a sign that he has finished the work of redemption and he sat down at the right hand of the Father. But as he intercedes for us, his church, he is waiting and our Savior himself is going to stand up. He's going to empty heaven of every angel, every saint. He's going to come back and finish the plan because God is watching over his word to perform it. And when he does, this event that occurs is emerging. In fact, I like to put it this way. The day of the Lord's second coming kind of puts those Old and New Testament ideas together. And what we're looking at this morning is the day of the Lord's second coming. And when the inheritor of everything and the creator of everything, as we saw last week, and the radiator of God's glory, and the one who is the representation of God sustaining everything, who purified our sins, when he comes as the ruler of everything, the universe, as we'll see this morning, it's like a cosmic earthquake. Now, that's kind of a, an oxymoron because an earthquake is localized to the earth quaking, but it's like more than the earthquakes. It's a cosmic event when the Creator comes back in wrath. And as Christ comes, the earth begins to quake. Every human with sin staining their lives starts crawling for cover. In fact, it's amazing how the Old Testament prophets talk about, in detail, about how the moles and the creeping things are going to be pushed out as humans burrow into the ground to escape, as if it were possible, God stepping onto the stage of human events. Well, 
Just to understand some key terms for a moment, remember the various ways God has chosen to describe the terminal event for earth dwellers. In a key passage, Daniel 9, we see God explains the end of days for earth as a buildup over seven years. Now, the Bible describes the whole seven years, and I'm going to kind of help you see a, a little panorama this morning of that time. The seven years is divided by God's word into various subdivisions. So, basically what we see It's a seven-year period. You ever heard of the seven-year tribulation? Where that comes from is Daniel 9, 27a. And and highlighted at the bottom is what Daniel says. Then he shall confirm a covenant with many for one week. And and the he is the the future ruler of Rome. And the, the covenant is with Israel. And he makes a, he solves the Arab Israeli problem better than John Kerry ever tr- could try to, or Hillary tried to, and, and Clinton tried, everybody's tried to solve it, but this man will. I, I, none of these other agreements are going to work because there's going to be a lingering, smoldering problem till the Antichrist comes. So that's the seven-year part. Now, what's interesting is the seven years, in verse 27 it says, but in the middle of the week, the week is seven years. The middle of it is three and a half years. So in God's way of looking at the future, God sees seven years divided into two distinct parts. And the, the middle of it is the breaking of the covenant that the future ruler of the revived Roman Empire breaks that he made with Israel. So that's the midpoint. In the middle of the week, he shall bring an end to sacrifice and offering. At the midpoint of what we call the tribulation, for the first three and a half years, the Jews are astonishingly allowed to build a temple and to start sacrificing animals. And they're just in their glory. They can't believe that the world's accepted them. And then he breaks that covenant. Well, the next element is that the doctrine of the second coming encompasses the events of the tribulation. It's also called in the Old Testament the day of the Lord. It's called in Daniel the seven years. It's also called 42 plus 42 months. See, it's the math of the future is that there's a seven-year period that's three and a half and three and a half years, or it's called 42 months and 42 months, or it's called 1,260 days and 1,260 days. It's kind of like saying a dollar or four quarters or 100 cents. You understand it's the same thing, just measured in different ways. And so what we see is the day of the Lord is the day of the Lord who returns. And what is that that fills the pages of Scripture is a warning to all sinners to repent while there's time. And what happens if they don't? Well, let's just take a moment to think about Revelation 6. And if you look down in your Bible, starting in verse 12, I want to show you what, and show you the chronology of what's going to happen. I'll do that with a graphic and try and represent this. But basically, the clearest picture comes when we merge the Old Testament understanding of the seven years of, of Israel's troubles and the midpoint and the Antichrist, and then using that as a grid place in the events that Revelation talks about. So here they are, and first of all, the white seal. Do you remember that? That's verses 1 and 2 of chapter 6. It's the white horse and rider of global deception, false peace and prosperity, the rise of the Superman called the Antichrist. And basically, as we saw last time, it's when God gives everybody what they always wanted. They always wanted this superhuman that they could see that was just like them and that they could worship and touch and, and just put all their hope in. And that's why he conquers so rapidly the world because he's kind of like the expected one and everybody will like him on their social media and everybody will follow him and and that's the first well second is the red horse and that's the red horse and rider of warfare and killing in verses three and four and god gives humans up as we saw last time to be what our lusts and and sinful hearts want, and that's our own way, which leads to murder, to warfare, and to death from fighting. And then comes the black horse, that third seal. And that's the spread of famine and scarcity. And, And God allows the earth to begin to not be such a hospitable place for humanity, which leads to the pale green horse, the final horseman of the apocalypse in verses 7 and 8. And that's a horrific duel of death and Hades. 
And when Christ is rejected, his spirit is restrained, when God the Father Almighty is unwanted all across the world, warfare and famine of the second and third seals, plus the addition of pestilences and plagues in this fourth seal, leads to, before any wrath of God, one out of every four humans dies in war, murdered, starves to death, or has a horrific pestilence that takes them down. It's a very sobering time. Well, then we come to the fifth seal, and the fifth seal is when the prayer of the martyrs is unleashed. Just as our prayers for God's kingdom to come are going to be reflected in his wrath during the tribulation, here we see those who have been slain during this, this peace and prosperity, warfare and famine and, and plagues and pestilence and death period, an uncountable multitude of people get saved. Probably the single greatest ingathering of humans to salvation in all of history. It's just amazing to think of that. And those are slain for their witness for Christ, and those martyrs are huddled under the throne, and God powerfully responds to their prayer, and the prayers break forth in the next seal. I want you to think about what happens with this, this sixth seal and what God does. As if a global dictator and global wars and global famines and global pestilences and death were not enough, now God's wrath. It's almost like the proverbial, you know, the kids keep doing, keep doing, keep doing, and the parent keeps watching and watching, and finally they respond. Now, the wrath of man works not the righteousness of God, but the wrath of God works the justice and righteousness of God. And that's what we're seeing here. And all the trouble of the tribulation so far, a fourth of all humans die in the first half, were generated by humans. But now, with the sixth seal, we get a little taste. The beginning, it's kind of like the appetizer. Now, amazing. If, if this is the appetizer, can you imagine what the meal is going to be like? In fact, Revelation 19 calls the, the crescendo of the, the tribulation as it culminates in Armageddon a, the great supper of God. It's like the, the, the great outpouring where he is providing people to be consumed by the, the birds of the air as they're killed. Well, Revelation 6, 12 to 17 is the sixth seal, and within this seal, John describes six succeeding disasters that strike the earth. And we're at the midpoint, you can see there, the center point that God designated. We, this chart is not uh, kind of imaginative, it's, it's just the literal events that God talks about. He talks about the beginning and the midpoint and the horrors of the midpoint, and this is when God steps in at the center. Well, in verse 12, after the wars that ravaged humanity, after the false promises of the Antichrist that seduced humanity away from the true gospel, seal number six is the shaking of the earth. And so when God shakes the earth, what happens? What happens when God steps back on the stage? When the creator that no one ever saw, when the redeemer that few ever acknowledged, when he comes back onto the stage, the earth begins to shake. Everything that humans have experienced for those 42 months of Revelation 6 verses 1 through 11 have been mostly self-induced. The first five seals chronicled the natural consequences of sinful humanity's evil ways. Those consequences were magnified because of the, remember the control rods of the spirit's restraint and the church's presence were removed. But the hand of God begins to take place. Well, what's the first thing? It's a great earthquake. Look at verse 12. And I looked, and when he opened the sixth seal, behold, there was a great earthquake. And John first notes that this is far more than any of the quakes that will be increasing during the tribulation. Now remember, it says in Matthew 24 that there are going to be an increasing crescendos in Matthew 24, 7 of earthquakes. 
And, and we've, we have them. I, I mean, there have been eight on the Richter and higher earthquakes. And, and there's thought that maybe at least once, sometimes, some of the largest quakes may have even been higher than some we've had in modern times. But this one is a mega seismos. This is the first of the cosmic quake events that verses 13 and 14 talk about. And this quake signals not only the six disasters starting in verse 12 through 17, as a, a, and by the way, mega and seismos, mega means big and, or great, and seismos means shaking. So it's a great shaking. Now, it's the earth is shaking, but we see in verses 13 and 14, it's not just the earth. The skies, everything is shaking in this. This is also, just by itself, the biggest, the strongest, the most powerful quake ever felt by humans on earth. Now, think about it. God says, okay, you've ignored me. You've rejected and killed my son. You've denied that I created everything from nothing as I describe it in the Bible. And so you want to you know if I'm here or not? And he sends this mega seismos. And God jolts humanity awake to his presence that they so long have ignored and denied. Well, secondly, look at the second part of verse 12. And the sun became black as sackcloth of hair. And what John sees reminds him of sackcloth. Now, sackcloth, remember, they clothe themselves when they're mourning with sackcloth. But this is, this is black, made from the, the hair of black goats. And so this is, this is very vivid in John's mind. And it portrays the suppression of sunlight by thick, dark clouds during the day. Now, to, to help you understand this, I want, you, I want to read to you from an uh, uh, incredible hydraulic engineer who's from uh, Virginia Tech uh, in Blacksburg, Virginia, who, who was saved and became a creationist, a, a, a man who was an expert in his own field in the sciences who the Lord got a hold of, and he used all that knowledge into creationism. And, and he actually wrote one of the more fascinating commentaries on, on the book of Revelation called The Revelation Record by Henry Morris. But this is what Dr. Morris writes using his understanding of, of the earth. He says, the great earthquake described here for the first time in history is a worldwide quake. We've never had a worldwide earthquake. We've had localized, you know. And, and if you read Drudge, you know, every time there's an earthquake, he always shows a map of the earth and there's a red dot there. And it's just there. It's not everywhere. This one is everywhere. But Morris goes on to say, seismologists and geophysicists in recent years have learned a great deal about the structure of the earth and about the cause and nature of quakes. The earth's solid crust is traversed with a complex network of faults. It kind of looks like little zipper lines all over that follow these fault lines, if you've ever seen a, uh, a map of the fault lines. Continuing, Morris says, they all rest upon a plastic mantle whose structure is still largely unknown. He's talking about the mantle of the earth. We, even all of our drilling and soundings, we still don't fully understand what's down there. He continues, in any case, the vast network of unstable earthquake belts around the world will suddenly begin to slip and fracture on a global basis, and a gigantic earthquake will ensue. This is evidently and naturally accompanied by a tremendous volcanic series of eruptions. Now think about that. The earthquake fault lines open fissures, which allow the, the, the white-hot magma in, within, beneath the, the surface of the earth, to erupt in those points. And so that's why it's called the ring of fire, if you notice the earthquake lines, especially around the Pacific Rim. And so tremendous volcanic eruptions spewing vast quantities of dust and steam and gas into the upper atmosphere. It is probably this event that causes the sun to be darkened and to look like someone put black, hairy burlap in the sky, and you can just barely see the sun through that. Well, it doesn't end there. The moon becomes like blood, and it says in verse 12, the third little phrase, and the moon became like blood. And the seismic volcanism of the first jolt of God's wrath leaves a lingering reminder 
as a global ash cloud obscures and alters weather by the reduction of sunlight and breathable air across the earth. Can you imagine? Can you imagine the whole earth is like Iceland was a while back when transatlantic flights couldn't go. The whole earth is kind of like they keep having over there in the Philippines when those are in Mexico when their big ones erupt. Can you imagine the gases, the dust, the ash, the darkness? But one common element in all the Old Testament prophets' description of this same event involves the moon's discoloration. As an ominous reminder of God's wrath, the sun will look like a black sheet has gone in front of it by day, and the moon, like a blood-red sheet, is in front of it at night. In fact, Isaiah puts it this way in chapter 13, verse 10. The sun will be dark when it rises, and the moon will not shed its light. Joel adds this, the sun will be turned into darkness, the moon into blood, before the great and awesome day of the Lord comes. Now see, the, the day of the Lord is the second coming, but the countdown to the day of the Lord is this event. But it doesn't end there. A fourth element the stars fall. And the stars of heaven, verse 13 says, fell to the earth as a fig tree drops its late figs when shaken by a mighty wind. As if the biggest quake followed by a light obscuring volcanic ash and atmospheric born choking dust weren't enough. Now comes another round of horrifying wrath unleashed by God. In the darkness of the day and the eerie redness of the night come flashes of light through the smoke-filled air. Like mortar shells raining down on a battlefield, God sends cosmic debris with blinding flashes across the sky followed by deafening sonic booms that echo across the entire globe. You say, oh, come on. Well, do you remember Valentine's Day? Or the day after, actually. Do you remember February 15th of this year? Everybody was transfixed by the fireball that streaked across Russia. And the sonic boom that shattered windows for miles was heard and, and went around the earth twice. That was this year. That was one. God sends, in fact, what's interesting is the Greek word here, if you look at the word in verse 13, stars, it's actually the word asteres, A-S-T-E-R-E-S. Asteres refers to anything in the sky other than the sun. That's just how the Greek language is. They have the sun, and anything else in the sky is an asteres, except for the moon. So you have the two we are sure of, and then they weren't sure of all the rest. And some of them moved. Those were the, the planes, the planets. But the ones that kind of stayed there were asteres. So what's interesting is this word that's used in verse 13 sounds ominously similar to our English word asteroids. And it's interesting, isn't it nice how NASA cooperates with my preaching schedule? On Friday, while I was in New York, the news said that NASA, the National Aeronautic and Space Administration of the United States, released a catalog for consumption by us normal people of the 1,400 dangerous objects that have a, a path that is going to bring them uncomfortably close to the earth in the next few years. There are 1,400 asteroids, cosmic debris out there. That's amazing. God lets earth dwellers see those up close when fireballs fill the skies of the entire globe, not just Russia and not just once. It will be like that recent sighting that, that lit up the global news outlets. One flash. Everybody was, was watching. I still remember that day. Everybody was, I mean, you couldn't go to anywhere without that being replayed, that whew, And it was showing from everybody's dash cams and security cameras. And they say it wasn't that big of an object. Can you imagine when God unleashes this volley? Only this time, there's no place to hide, no place untouched by the booms, by the crashes, and by the horror of incoming missiles from God. Asteris. Well, it doesn't end there. Next, we see that God has the sky splitting. Look at 
chapter 6, verse 14. The sky receded as a scroll when it is rolled up. And Jesus promised just this event in Luke 21 and verse 11. He said that there are going to be events in the sky that people would see that would lead them to heart attacks and death. In fact, Jesus put it this way. Their hearts would fail them for fear when they see what happens. It's amazing to think. This is probably what John sees when he describes the sky receded like a scroll. When everything above us, the realm of the prince of the power of the air, is struck by God, humans are melted with terror. Can you imagine just stuff streaking around and all of a sudden it's just like the clouds all go Whoa, and you just, you just say, what else is going to happen? Well, something else happens. Look at verse 14. And every mountain and island is moved out of its place. Now, these are successive. They appear to be all, uh, in fact, the best way to understand the book of the Revelation and all the, the seals and trumpets and bowls is kind of like going to a 4th of July when there wasn't tax, money, revenue uh, decrease and when they could really have a good fireworks show. And if you remember, you know, they just do a little and nobody pays any attention. It's just little stuff. And all of a sudden, the tempo increases and you know you're getting near the finale. And all of a sudden, there's nothing. And then there's that boom. And you see the trail going up. And then everyone goes, oh, and there's this big deal. But then from that, as the firework begins to make its way down, you see this cascading, telescoping, more and more coming out until finally, boom, 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 you know, and you're hoping you're closer to the car by then so you don't lose your hearing. That is very much like the unfolding. This is chapter 6, verses 12 through 17 is the boom. And then the six are the initial, oh. But from chapter 7 on, it's the boom, 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 boom. And it's hard to think how hard it's going to be for those who are alive. Well, verse 14 at the end, John captures the final event of the sixth seal unleashed. John describes what could only be called a crustal paroxysm. Now, what do I mean by that? Well, everything above sea level, as far as parts of the crust of the earth, all began at the same time to move. What an amazing thought that everything moves around in a spasm as the Creator touches the earth. Two pages after the last comment I read by Dr. Morris comes this little paragraph. This is what a hydraulic engineer says. The earth's crust is highly unstable and has been ever since the great flood. It will be disturbed by the impacting asteroids, by the volcanic explosions, and by the worldwide greatest quake of all time. And great segments of the Earth's crust will actually begin to slip and slide over Earth's deep plastic mantle. Geophysicists for many years have been fascinated with the idea of continental drift. Some such phenomenon may actually be triggered under this judgment of the sixth seal, dwarfing the damage occasioned by the mighty earthquakes of the past. So just think about, you know, the earthquakes that have done massive damage. Can you imagine a big earthquake, the sun, the moon, then the fireballs, and then the sky just rolls back and splits, and then all of a sudden everything moves. This is just the beginning. So God enters human events. And as God enters human events in a most visible way, no human ever witnessed God in the act of creation. Few humans witness God in human flesh walking the earth. But all humans will feel the jolt of God. And all humans are terrified. They die of fear. And those who don't flee his face. Now, let's look at what happens. Look at verse 15. Mankind hides. And if you look down in your Bible, this is the result of the opening volley of the tribulation. The kings of the earth, the great men, the rich men, the commanders, the mighty men, the slave, and every free man hid themselves in the caves and rocks and mountains and said to the mountains and rocks, fall on us, hide us from the face of him who sits on the throne. Whoa. 
it sounds like there are no more atheists left. It says everyone. Isn't that interesting? You know what? This should end the whole show right there. They should drop to their knees and repent. But you know what? Two chapters later, you know what it says? After all this, they would not repent of their fornications, their thefts, their murders, and their drug usage. They love their sin more than the God they don't deny any longer, the true and living God. And they say, fall on us, verse 16, hide us from the face of him who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. That's an interesting combination. It, sh it should be like, in our minds, wrath of a lion, but it's a lamb, the wrath of the Lamb of God. Verse 17, for the great day of his wrath has come, and who is able to stand? Welcome to the worst day ever to come to earth, and God is only starting. This is the first third of what God has planned. The seven trumpets and the seven bowls will follow the seventh seal that is the next event. Well, the lesson is the ruler of everything is coming. Jesus is seated in heaven right now at the right hand of God the Father. Jesus is interceding for us, his church, right now. When Jesus sat down, it meant that his work of salvation was finished and he was going to watch over all of his promises to us to perform them in and through us. Did you know while those prophecies are slumbering, the promises of God are energized by the Spirit of God to work through us? God says, why? I'm going to destroy everything. Don't, don't spend your life doing anything that's going to be left on earth because I'm going to just destroy it all. Why don't you labor for what can never be destroyed? Why don't you let my promises energize you to live for me? You see the ending. Nothing here is worth investing in. Jesus paid the price. Jesus earned the right to redeem us. He ever lives to intercede for us. He's opened the way to the Father. He's going to prepare a place for us. And our Savior himself is going to rise from the right hand of God Almighty. And Jesus Christ is going to empty heaven of every angel and every saint and come back to finish the plan of God. And as Christ comes, the earth begins to quake. And every human with sin staining their lives instead of repenting begins to crawl for a hole to burrow into the ground. They cry out in fear that will forever consume them as the torments of an angry God begin to fall on them. Well, it's kind of negative, but it's true. And so you know what that makes me think of? A year after I was born, uh, a hymn writer from Grand Rapids wrote a little catchy hymn that for 56 years has circulated around many churches. So what I thought what we do before we go today is kind of have a happy ending. So let's all stand and let's read this. How many of you ever heard of John W. Peterson? Yeah, yeah, there we go. He's got a few friends here, all the, the people my age and up. But how many have ever heard this song, Coming Again, Coming Again, Maybe morning, maybe noon, maybe evening. And we used to change it at Lake Lansing Baptist and say, surely soon. Peterson only said, maybe soon. But let's, let's read. This is the last stanza. And I guess this is what we need to kind of focus on. Remember, everything we're studying, and the reason we're studying Revelation is it was written for the church. And it was written if we would hear it and respond to it to be a blessing in our lives. And the blessing for our lives is what we're going to read. Let's just read that first stanza. Standing before him at last, trial and trouble all past, crowns at his feet we will cast. Jesus is coming again. You want to try singing the chorus? Let's just try it. And if you don't know it, just hum along. Okay, here we go. Coming again, coming again, maybe morning, maybe noon, maybe evening, and maybe soon, coming again. 
coming again. Oh, what a wonderful day it will be. Jesus is coming again. Amen? Amen. Now, before you go, for five years I've said the same thing when I come up here to, uh, just before I speak, I say, thank you, John. But now, thank you, John, wants to come up here, right? You are coming. I don't have to read that and cry, do I? Okay, and he's going to come and share something with us. Might as well be seated. <laughs> this won't take too long. but Well, 13 years ago, I stepped foot into Calvary for the first time, and it was a bit of a scary and transitioning time in my life. I moved here to work on my master's degree in saxophone at Western, and I had plans of my own to spend two years here and move back to Chicago to be close to my girlfriend, Shay, who is now, of course, my wife of 11 years and mother of our three precious girls. You see, God has a way of changing your plans. He shows you his plans, which are higher and much better, and he leads and prompts and guides you along the path, asking you to walk by faith and not by sight. So after those two years at Western, serving on the worship team here and helping to lead the college worship ministry, I realized that my plans uh, to go on and get a doctorate in music and pursue teaching at the collegiate level were not God's plans for me. He had placed in my heart a desire to lead worship and open the door to an internship here at Calvary, which over the course of another two years, he would use to confirm that calling on my life. So in 2004, after the two-year internship, I came on staff full-time as the assistant worship director under Pastor Tim Hathaway. And God grew me tremendously during that time and has continued to be faithful to help me grow ever since. Well, in 2006, after Pastor Monroe and Pastor Hathaway were called by the Lord to serve in Charlotte, he opened the door for me to steward more responsibility for the corporate singing of the church and leadership of the worship ministry. In Psalm 66, 2, the Lord says to make his praise glorious. So for the last seven years, alongside many friends and co-laborers, we have followed the Lord's call to do that, trying our best by God's grace to magnify the Lord's greatness in all of our hearts each week. Well, over the last year and a half or so, God began to work once again to show me that his ways and plans are higher than mine. I can say he is a God who does the unexpected in our lives. We sold our home about two years ago, and God provided a rental home uh, to us through a family here at the church, which has blessed our family tremendously. The Lord planted a seed in my heart some months ago while reading a book about church planning. I was affected by the idea of the mission of starting a new church and wondered if the Lord would ever call our family to be part of something like that. And in all honesty... I pretty much wrote it off because I couldn't figure out in my own wisdom how that would ever work. So since the beginning of the summer, we have been praying, at, seeking, asking, knocking, and most of all, trusting. We began taking one step of faith at a time, and God has confirmed in our hearts over and over that he is indeed calling us to a new chapter and serving him as part of a church plant in Franklin, Tennessee. Since the church is brand new, uh, we will be serving and volunteering using our gifts as the Lord leads and in the way that Paul was a tent maker, the Lord knew I would need some kind of a trade, so he opened the door in a completely unexpected way, and I'm now a licensed mortgage loan originator and will be working for a Christian man as his loan assistant. So what's next for the Althoffs? Well, September 1st will be our last Sunday officially serving Calvary Bible Church on staff. We will move to Nashville later that week. Ultimately, we are going to declare the gospel of Jesus Christ to a lost world in an area where self-dependence is rampant. We long to be able to share Christ with our new apartment neighbors, and we hope to have Bible studies in our home, see people be made alive with new life in Christ, and be used to help them walk as disciples of Jesus, worshiping him alone with all their heart and soul and mind and strength. We have cherished our time at Calvary more than we could ever express. God has used so many of you in our lives to encourage, guide, love, disciple, and grow us to be prepared for this next step. We will have so many memories and stories of God's grace and friendships, of laughter and trials, and having shared our lives with you these last 13 years. We want you to know that we love you as our family in Christ, and we look forward to seeing how God moves in your lives and in the life of Calvary as a church over the coming years. We hope to visit as often as the Lord allows, and we trust that many of you will come up with a good excuse to come and see us in Nashville. So I can think of no better way to close this letter than Paul's words to the Ephesians in chapter 3, verse 14 through 21. Paul says, for this reason, I bow my knees before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth is named, that according to the riches of his glory, he may grant you to be strengthened with power through his spirit and in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, 
that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may have strength to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth, and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all that we ask or think, according to the power at work within us, to him be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Okay, let's stand. Uh, we are going to be having a send-off uh, special evening time. Did we set the date? We're trying to find next, week, think, next Sunday night. So, you know, plan your schedule around that so you can have time to see John and Shay and the family. But let's just close in prayer and thank the Lord for uh, what he has done. Father, I thank you uh, that you have given to us such a humble and godly and gifted man who for all these years uh, that I have witnessed him and that we have sat under his ministry has refused to let the spotlight be on his life. And when he has prayed, scriptures have flowed. And when he has sung, the radiance of Christ is what we noticed, not him. And so in the words of the psalmist, not unto us, O Lord, not unto us, but unto thy name be the glory. Thank you for letting us see that in our worship leader for all these years. And I pray for John and Shay. They truly are launching out into a mission of faith, taking a tremendous uh, uh, lowering of their, their standard of living for their salary, going into a very needy situation but they're going because they want to serve you. I thank you for calling them, gifting them, and now sending them. And may they know the prayers of their family here and the encouraging support as they go out. Bless them in these days of packing and saying goodbye and excitedly looking to the future. And we ask that now in the precious name of Jesus and for his glory and all of God's people said, amen. God bless you as you go. Thank you.